He is Dr. Kirti Deulweva. He is a consultant cardiac electrophysiologist at Teaching Hospital Kurunayagala. Today he will talk to us on rhythm abnormalities seen in the cardiac monitor. What to do? Over to you, Kirti. Uh, uh, very good morning to you all. Uh, I am Dr. Kirti Deulweva, consultant cardiac electrophysiologist attached to Teaching Hospital Kurunayagala. Uh, firstly, I should thank the President and the Council members of Sri Lanka College of Cardiology for giving me this opportunity to deliver a talk on this historical annual academic events. Without further ado, I'll speak with, start with my presentation. Today, the topic that I'm going to discuss is the rhythm abnormality seats in the cardiac monitor, what to do. And this is a typical... Uh, uh, day in cardiology. If you see all these monitors uh, displays in this monitor, you can see various type of abnormalities uh, on these monitors. And uh, basic rules that worth following in this type of scenario in order to treat our patients and pick their abnormalities quite quickly and attend them as early as possible in order to save a life. We come across various situations with and conditions with our patients, and it's important to aware what type of patient that are having increased risk of arrhythmias, and we need to identify uh, when to act immediately, and most importantly, when to not to act. It's, it's our responsibility to uh, get ourselves familiarized with the equipments available. As we know, most coronary care units have centralized ECG, ECG monitoring, the one that I showed earlier. And most of these monitors have the single lead ECG, maybe more than one or two leads that can be choosed and pulse oximeter reading. It's important to set alarms and cutoff according to the patients and make sure that we attend all these alarms and readjust and, uh, uh, and set the volume uh, set the, uh, the, the parameters up, rather than uh, uh, turning the volume down or ignoring them completely. And uh, remember, none of these equipments, neither 100% sensitive specific. So there comes a situation where a monitor might cry out loud for, a, for innocent things while keep completely dead silent for uh, immediately life-threatening. And make sure that you always go by patient symptoms and sign. And it's very important that uh, we get ourselves trained and experienced uh, uh, about the scenarios that we can come across. So what patients that are high, at high risk of having arrhythmic abnormalities? Obviously, in my patients, heart failure patients, and oleander poisoning or carnero poisoning is common in this, this part of the world. And people who are on temporary pacing wires and any critically ill patient. And as we know, none of all these patients are very con common in our practice. So make sure that uh, our patients are well connected to monitor, check the leads and check the pulse oximeter and confirm if you come across an ECG abnormality, make sure that you confirm with the patient identity. If you spot an ECG abnormality on the monitor, Develop a spontaneous habit to look for the pulse waveform, which is very important to tell you lots of details about the patient's hemodynamic status. And always look for patient symptoms and ECG correlations. Verify monitor abnormality with the patient and follow the habit to do the look, listen and feel. And that is something you need to get yourself trained. And do not forget artifacts and noises Sometimes patients tremors, loose lead, and for the electrical equipment can give rise to abnormal ECGs. So how do you approach a situation like this? If you notice an abnormality on the monitor, make sure verify with the patient and talk to the patient, touch the patient, check for the pulse. And if you're going to check the pulse, uh, go for the femoral pulse that you give you the better understanding about the patient. And if you think your patient doesn't have pulse and not responding, shout for help and start CPR. And it is in charge responsibility who uh, to make sure that uh, um, uh, the availability of self-adhesive defibrillating pads 
in your in your ward or ICU setup. So, what is classified as abnormal rhythm? If a patient is having heart rate of more than 100, that is abnormal. Do you need to have an explanation for that? If a patient is having a heart rate less than 60, then again it is abnormal. And definitely, if a patient is having a heart rate of less than 40, that is extremely abnormal. Look at this abnormality on the monitor. You can see the first row, nicely P waves and QRS coupled to one another. But here comes, there's no QRS complexes, there's only P waves. So it's a com patient has dual a complete heart block and gone into ventricular stand still. If you don't do anything about this patient, that patient will die. This is something you need to aware. And remember, as I told you earlier, our monitors doesn't sometimes pick up these abnormalities. Look at here, this patient's monitor is showing the heart rate of 91, but you get the ECG. You could see the patient is in complete heart block. Nowhere whatsoever that patient is having a heart rate of 91. So just by looking at the monitor, you may be falsely reassured that the patient is having a very good heart rate, but it is not the case. These are the things that you need to get yourself trained. So if you come across a patient having extreme bradycardia, if a patient is unconscious, call help and start CPR. And as, as nurses and other uh, allied health uh, professionals, you need to aware these are the type of medication that we use in a setup, setup like that, like IV atropine, isoprenaline, IV adrenaline, and make sure yourself, get yourself trained to use transcutaneous spacing. And this is how almost all modern defibrillators comes with the ability to do transcutaneous spacing. And for that, you need self-adhesive defibrillation patches, and you need to aware how we are going to stick these things into our patients. And these are the type of monitors. If you see them carefully, you can see you can choose uh, uh, these uh, monitor setups uh, uh, in order to allow a pacing to happen. And this is a patient who has a first degree heart block. Generally, the heart rate is normally not going to be low. Only the PR interval is prolonged. And this is generally uh, not uh, uh, mal uh, harmful to the patient on its own trying. But in case of oleander poisoning, you are expecting them to develop further advanced heart blocks. So you need to pick these things up and uh, alert your doctor. In this case, the patient has developed into two to one heart block. You can see the heart rate has started to drop. And this thing, before patients develop into complete heart block, you need to pick these things up. Look at here, the pulse oxygen meter tracing. This patient has developed an abnormal a fast rhythm. Look at the pulse oximeter recording. Nicely, there was a nice uh, deflection, but suddenly when the patient started to uh, develop the tachycardia, the pulse wave form has gone flat. That means that patient doesn't have pulse. So this is an emergency situation. You need to start giving CPR. Look at here. This patient has developed non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Look at the pulse wave form. There's no, there's hardly any pulse. So these are abnormal and these things, patient may not be having symptoms because this is a very brief thing, but the next time the patient might develop a, uh, uh, a prolonged arrhythmia that you need to alert your doctor to have a look and do something about this. And this is a ventricular tachycardia on the monitor. And this is a atrial flutter. You can see the blood pressure is all right, but though the heart rate is going more than 100, and this is a, a SVT, a narrow complex fast tachycardia. Look at the heart rate, 186. Look at the blood pressure is low. This is a situation where you need to cardio with this patient. So remember about the cells side which you patches. This is where you need to uh, bring your uh, seat, uh, defibrillation machine close to the patient, alarm your doctor. This is a ventricular fibrillation. If you see this, you need to jump uh, to the patient and and start CPR. And look at this patient, this ECG, this patient has developed ST elevation. Now the patient has gone into ventricular fibrillation. These are life threatening situations. You need to pick these things up and make sure and start CPR. And I, did you remember I was mentioning about artifact? You can see this is an artifact. So before jumping to the, uh, to the patient, you need to make sure that the patient's ECG and symptoms correlate. So if you come across a patient with an abnormal rhythm, make sure that the patient is uh, correctly uh, patient, the, the right ECG for the right patient. And if the patient is not conscious, call for help and start CPR. And you need to 
make sure uh, get your defibrillator ready M- medications like amidron or iv adenosine or even iv adenine ready and the other scenarios where normally you come across patients with temporary pacemakers and uh, these are the situation that you normally come across and look at here this patient uh, having a temporary pacemaker but that pacemaker doesn't catch and you can you can see the heart rate is 29 so this is a situation that you need to alarm your doctor and this is a, a very unusual issue this patient has severe hyperkalemia look at the broad complex this is a peri arrest rhythm if you see this you need to start uh, notify your doctor immediately uh, come to attend this patient though the blood pressure is okay though the heart rate is low okay you can see it's around 90 but this is a very abnormal rhythm this this is just few minutes before the patient go uh, goes is to cardiac arrest so thank you for listening have a pleasant day thank you thank you kirti uh, that was an excellent lecture highlighting very important points especially the uh, to uh, highlighting the fact that you have to not only read the numbers but you have to look at the uh, wave pattern also in the monitor um, can we have the lecturers online please yes okay um yes uh, kirti hello kirti hello hello can you hear me yes hello yeah, yes. yeah. um yeah. can i ask you the first question this is from our um, uh, online audience uh, yes how long uh, can we use external pacing pads for severe bradycardic patient Uh, especially a uh, patient who was who is admitted uh, to a rural hospital uh, uh, that's a good question obviously the uh, two problems with external cardiac pacing and it is uh, it is very painful for the patient as well so you need to sedate the patient and secondly uh, uh, sometimes you might find it very difficult to confirm that actually the heart is capturing so therefore uh it's only a bridging therapy uh, external uh, pacing so uh you need to have a more more permanent solution so uh, in a rural setup that is where you need to transfer your patient as early as possible and in the meantime certain medication can help you if you like you know isoprenorphine is available uh, you can set them and try to have a better heart rate because uh, you need to sedate your patient very well uh otherwise patient may not tolerate uh, external pacing so it has it should only be used as a bridging therapy until you have a more permanent solution like having a temporary pacemaker via putting uh thank you kirti there's one more question yeah. for you uh can you explain the difference between the dc cardioversion and dc shock uh do they, these two terms are loosely used uh, shock is actually a bit of a lay term shock means you are giving an electrical wave in order to defibrillate the heart dc cardioversion is a is a more of a technical term and that is where we normally uh, gives energy in a uh, in a synchronized fashion in order to treat Uh, uh, SVT or a ventricular tachycardia, uh, except defibrillation. So the other uh, term should be the defibrillation, where we give energy to a patient uh, asynchronized manner uh, in the presence of a defibrillation. So DC shock is a is a is a is probably a, a lay term, uh, or which is not very technical. So DC cardioversion is a technical term that is where we give energy. in a synchronized session to a patient in order to restore the rhythm and and normally it is not ventricular fibrillation it should be either svt or a ventricular tachycardia where the rhythm is regular uh thank you very much kirti um ambi are you uh, here as well Ambi can you hear us? Um Ambi your audio is apparently on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Um Hello. 
Chamara. I'm here. Uh, hi. Good morning. Um, Ami, audio is apparently on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, hi. You can hear us now, yes? It is again muted. <laughs> You can hear us now, yes? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear us? Yeah, yeah. Okay, hi, Ambi. Uh, got a question from the audience for you as well. Um, are there any early signs to identify aortic dissection in a pregnant patient? Um, you can hear us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hi, Ambi. Hi. Uh, got a question from the audience for you as well. Yeah. Um, are there any early signs to identify aortic dissection in a pregnant patient? Um, actually, it's a quite difficult question to answer because it's normally the um, You can hear us? Yes. Hello. Okay. Hi, Ambi. Hi. Okay. Uh, j just to uh, interrupt here. So, uh, Ambi, apparently you have uh, logged in on two devices. Is that correct? Maybe you could log off one of them. Because we are getting a bit of a replay of uh, uh, what we've been talking as well. Is that better now? Uh, hold on, I wait. You're logged on to two devices apparently, so just log off one of them. Okay, maybe she logged off all of them, maybe, hopefully. Um, okay, in the meantime, uh, can I ask uh, Keith if he is still available? One more question. Yeah, I'm available. Yeah. Uh, Keith, there's Go one ahead. more question from uh, the audience. Uh, how do we yes. give ad uh, uh, intravenous adenosine? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, intravenous adenosine is a is a is a is a medication that has a very short acting, uh, uh, short lasting effect. So it should be a big uh, push. Uh, you can draw adrenal uh, adenosine from the vial and use a big vein. Uh, the recommended vein is actually anticubital vein that is uh, in your in your elbow. So give a quick push. It depends on the uh, depends on the condition. You can choose between six milligram up to eighteen milligram in certain situation, and give a big a quick push. And definitely should be followed by giving a twenty mL of normal saline push because the medication has to go into the system as quickly as possible with, uh, without uh, losing its effect, so it can exert the effect on the heart and uh, give the desired effect. Um. Thank you very much, Kirti. I think uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Ambika is uh, back online, so we'll, uh, we'll just re repeat that question again. Ambi, can you hear us again? Loud and yes, clear? Sorry for the That's all right. Thanks for joining us again. Ambi, quick, quick one again, the same question. Uh, how do you uh, uh, differentiate the chest pain when a pregnant lady comes and you're suspecting aortic dissection? Um, actually, it's a quite difficult question. Most of the time, the pregnant people are coming with very atypical presentation. We can't expect the typical aortic dissection pain, most uh, typical crushing type pain, radiate to back. But the thing is, if they are coming with very unusual type of chest pain, if then we have to go with the clear history and careful assessment whether they have some sort of any blood pressure difference and then we have to be in that case with the um, card CT hydrogram is not a first line investigation concerning the pregnancy then we should have to think about to go for a trans thoracic echocardiogram actually that is not a diagnostic tool to diagnose but we can show if there's any evidence of aortic root dilatation sometimes we can able to catch the dissection flap and associated with aortic regurgitation in though if the uh, 
thoracic echocardiogram is not diagnostic if they couldn't come for any sort of diagnosis if you can think about is more towards that dissection the finally we have to consider to you go for the ct echocardiogram but using the abdominal shield for safeguard of the fetus from the radiation much uh dr ambiga for answering that question as well and uh, we do apologize for the slight technical uh mishaps there uh however so that uh, brings an end to the second symposium for the morning as well i hope that uh